to our distinguished speakers, uh, panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Hezekiah Pire. I lead the water and sanitation team at UN Habitat in Nairobi. I will be moderating this webinar together with my colleagues, Andre Zikus, who is the chief of the urban basic services section at UN Habitat, and Ms. Dewi Hanum, who is our program management officer based in Cairo. Uh, to start off uh, the webinar, uh, let us look at uh, some of the, the house rules. Thank you. So this webinar will be recorded and made available on demand on the IWA Connect Plus platform and the IWA network website uh, with presentation slides and other information. Uh, the speakers are responsible for securing cop copyright permissions for any work that they will present, of which they are not the legal copyright holder. The opinions, hypotheses, conclusions, and recommendations contained in the presentations and other materials are the sole of the speakers and do not necessarily re reflect the IWA opinion. Uh, so this for this webinar for participation, we have a chat box. So please use this for general requests. We also have a Q&A box. Please use this to send questions to the panelists. We will answer uh, these questions during the Q&A uh, section. So let me hand it over to my colleague, Andre Zikus, to introduce the speakers and continue with the well, moderation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pire, for taking us through the housekeeping uh, part. And a big welcome, good morning, good uh, lunchtime, or good afternoon and evening in different parts of the world. And uh, thank you very much for joining this webinar with the title on Placing Sanitation at the Center of Urban Planning and Development. And just to mention as a backdrop, that UN Habitat has been implementing the uh, Scaling Citywide Inclusive Sanitation Systems Project in various countries and various parts of the world, and a program and project which has been uh, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation since 2020. And as part of this project, uh, UN Habitat actually launched the Global Report on Sanitation and Wastewater management in cities and human settlements during the second session of the UN Habitat Assembly here in Nairobi, which was held in June 2023. And uh, with 18 cities and five inspiring in-depth case studies, the global report actually demonstrates that cities are beginning to develop the economic, institutional, and regulatory measures required to ensure the agriculture sector and wider society can benefit from treated wastewater. The webinar is part of a series of webinars jointly organized by UN Habitat and IWA to disseminate the key findings and recommendations of this global report. It will focus on key messages and priority actions outlined in Chapter 10 of the global report on integrating wastewater and fecal sludge management services with wider urban development and slum upgrading processes. With this, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to go over and introduce our first uh, speaker, Francois Briquet, um, who is from the Inclusive Urban Sanitation Team Lead in IWA. Francois is a development economist and a sanitary engineer with more than 30 years of experience. Currently, he leads the Inclusive Urban Sanitation Initiative at IWA, based in London. After holding senior positions at the World Bank as the regional team leader of the Water and Sanitation Program in Latin America, at UNICEF as WASH chief in Indonesia, at Mark, uh, Mott McDonald as country lead for the Future Cities Program, also in Indonesia, and at the Global Water Partnership, a senior networking officer for Central and West Africa and for Central and East Asia. And at the IRC International Water and Sanitation Center based in The Hague, as program officer specialized in sustainability. Francois believes that water and sanitation development is both a technical and human issue. Indeed, behind any design, plan and action, 
there are professionals and organizations who make decisions that will affect people's lives. With this introduction, Francois, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Andre, uh, for this uh, introduction. And I would have hoped that I could do the same for you, Andre, <laughs> but we will have the opportunity. So w welcome, uh, everybody, uh, uh, where are you, wherever you are from, uh, from Africa, Asia, Europe. I see a lot of uh, names uh, in different countries being represented. I'm, um, as I said, my name is Francois Briquet, and I'm, I'm leading the uh, uh, the project here on inclusive urban sanitation in uh, the International Water Association. Um, it's really an honor to to work uh, with the UN Habitat on this uh, uh, issue because, uh, as you all know, um, sanitation is still um, far behind uh, reaching the uh, expected goals from uh, from uh, the SDGs. We have a lot of work to do. And um, we are extremely um, uh, pleased that this uh, could be done also with uh, uh, with UN Habitat. There's been a bit of a change of strategy with some of our key donors, which uh, maybe some of you have heard. But uh, this doesn't mean that we will not keep on going. Uh, we can you can be resting assured that we will be going on with um, pursuing that all the work that was done, notably on on uh, citywide inclusive sanitation, that this will go on. Um, we we do believe that, uh, as um, Andre said, that um, sanitation development is, of course, a, a technical issue. Um, it's a, also an institutional issue. It's a social issue, an environmental issue, a health issue, and of course, um, um, it's it's everybody's life because when we don't deal about this correctly, um, it it can affect the whole city. And uh, so we are still seeing this uh, situation very, uh, in a very drastic situation in most of the places, uh, uh, big cities in, uh, in developing countries. So really placing sanitation at the center of urban planning and development makes sense. If we really want to get our act uh, together to move uh, uh, sanitation to actually reach the SDGs, it's extremely um, important that we really put this at the center. It's not the first time we mentioned that. What is the difference we want to make this time? And I think it's really, we need to work indeed with, um, um, I mean, uh, the, the policy makers and the uh, uh, funders <laughs> where the money source is coming. But we really need to work also at the municipal level because sanitation is really a local issue. And so, really, I believe that you, if you have joined this uh, webinar and you want to see things moving, you've joined the right webinar. We, as I mentioned um, at the beginning, uh, IWA will be very much involved for the coming two years. We have secured um, enough resources to do so. We have uh, secured enough uh, um, um, uh, so, I mean, all kind of resources that are human and uh, financial. And, and I would like to thank you very much for, um, uh, thank you and Habitat very much for this ongoing collaboration. It's, um, we are going to go on. And I would like to thank all, each one of you. We remain absolutely open to any kind of um, uh, exchange you may want to have. We will be in touch with you. Please connect with us. We will be very pleased to, 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 um, um, help you move the sanitation agenda where you are. So thank you very much, uh, Andre. I think now we, these were my introductory remarks. I wish you a very good webinar. So Andre, up to you now. now. Thank you so much, Francois, for this introduction. And of course, the long journey, which we've worked together over the many, many years. Um, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a great pleasure now to introduce the opening remarks and keynote speaker for this event, that's uh, Dr. Shipra Narang Suri, who is the chief of urban, uh, the urban practices branch at UN Habitat. And she'll be giving her opening remarks on sanitation and wastewater management. How do they fit in urban planning? Shipra, with over 25 years of experience within and outside of the United Nations, leads the uh, UN Habitat's urban practices branch which is the hub for UN Habitat's normative work and the home of its portfolio of global programs spread across 50 countries. And the branch leads several major areas of UN Habitat's work, such as national urban policies, 
legislation and governance, urban planning and design, planning and health, public space, urban regeneration, land, housing and shelter, urban economy and finance, urban basic services, safer cities, human rights, and so and SDG localization. So quite a broad portfolio and practically the whole spectrum of UN Habitat's work. She also oversees the Local 2030 Coalition, the UN system-wide coalition and platform for SDG localization, whose secretariat and chair is held by UN Habitat in Bilbao in Spain. And she's a regular public speaker and has numerous publications to her credit. Shipra, the floor is all yours. Thanks very much, Andre. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Francois. Um, and really a pleasure and an honor to be to be speaking to you all today. And apologies in advance if you hear uh, construction noise in our background. We are in the midst of some, some renovations here at our office. Um, Francois just talked about how sanitation is a is a social issue, is an economic issue, is a health issue, uh, and and is an issue that is an issue that affects in our lives. We can see the planning issue as well. So it's not really about fitting it within urban planning as as my my topic says today, but it is really about uh, mainstreaming and recognizing and acknowledging that sanitation is fundamentally uh, an urban planning issue along with the other dimensions that we talked about. There is a very close link between SDG 6 on water and sanitation and SDG 11 uh, on cities and human settlements because of course more than half the world of our problem people live in urban areas today and this number is, is only growing. And there are other numbers. Two billion people lack access to safe drinking water around the world. Three and a half million people lack safely managed sanitation services. And we know, those of us who work in cities and communities, we know that these numbers, uh, these figures, disproportionately affect informal settlements, slum communities, poorer communities and cities, where residents face uh, a much increased risk, a heightened risk of of waterborne diseases and health issues due to the absence of services and due to the general precariousness of their living environment. We also know that with climate change, um, you know, a greater number of people are impacted by the rising intensity and frequency of climate-induced disasters and of climate-related and the impact of climate-related factors. About 1.8 billion people are at risk of flooding. 1.5 billion people face risks from, from droughts. Um, someone said uh, maybe three quarters of a billion people live in coastal communities at the risk of sea, sea, sea level rise uh, and, and many more at, uh, at, you know, at, at, at the risk of uh, in, internal flooding in cities. So there is really a crisis that we are a multiple a multiplicity of crises that we are facing, and a lot of it centers around sustainable urbanization and within that provision of basic services and sanitation. And this is only going to seven billion people are expected to live in urban areas by two. That's two thirds of the world's population. So you can imagine the pressure on cities and on local governments and on public services. What happens when we have uh, unplanned and unmanaged urbanization, as we see in many, many parts of, of the world. We see a limitation in, in water sources through, through increasing pollution, through uncontrolled extraction, through leakages, through, through insufficient recharge. At the territorial level, we are seeing a lack of planning leading to the destruction of natural areas, wetlands, forests, catchment areas, uh, river banks. Uh, and then we have, of course, um, you know, uh, increasing water-related risks uh, like flooding and like, like droughts. What we're seeing at UN Habitat is that multi-scalar increases and integrated development planning can enhance waste and water management, can facilitate and increase the recharge of water sources, and uh, an equitable distribution of water in each city and neighborhood scales because water is a cross-boundary issue. 
We know that innovative urban planning principles that promote designs which are compact, connected, mixed with more green spaces and more green networks can reduce the strength of water and sanitation infrastructure and, and services. And if we follow those principles, then we, we know that that means that we should focus on reducing urban sprawl, on prioritizing high density development, on incorporating nature based solutions, river regeneration, water recycling. If we do all that, we also reduce the cost of provision of water and sanitation services, because then they can be delivered at scale in a, in a more compact uh, way. Another important piece in this in this whole equation is to increase the capacity of local governments, uh, the planning department, water and sanitation service providers, uh, and it's very important to enhance that capacity to more demand for services. We do this through multi-level governance, we do this through policy reform, we do this through institutional capacity building, localization of the SDGs, collecting the right data, empowering them to collect the right data. And, and develop evidence-based policies uh, and through partnerships with organizations. So it's a really, it's a really big thing. I would like to maybe offer a few points on how um, we can integrate water and sanitation service plans with wider urban sanitation processes. And these, these, these ideas and these reflections could be useful for national governments, the city authorities, and other planners. The service providers and really the whole community that is gathered here today, and I've seen it and people online, so it's, it's really interesting that. I think first, first and foremost, we need to integrate spatial plans with water and sanitation service plans. Unless spatial and development plans and, and service plans for, for water, sanitation, drainage, all the waste management are integrated, the risk of service failure will remain and will in fact be magnified. Um, we cannot treat them as, as sectoral issues separately and uh, urban development and urban planning. Uh, in Korog, in Tajikistan, for example, you have habitat assisted the local government to integrate spatial planning uh, that aimed at enhancing environmental and social economic resilience. And, and this was very, very much focused on um, applying an evidence based uh, approach to assess uh, water supply sanitation networks. Uh, evaluating their current future capacity and assessing uh, their vulnerability to natural disasters. We, we also have another program in, in Kenya, uh, which is called the Go Blue, which is um, uh, which has led uh, where we have led six coastal counties in Kenya to develop and integrate land and sea planning guidelines to spatial plans. Then the second uh, way uh, and and the second. Um, point that I would like to make is around strengthening evidence-based planning and policy making by, by, by supporting uh, the collection and analysis of local disaggregated data and integrating rigorous research data analytics into decision-making processes. Uh, UN Habitat has something called the Global Urban Monitoring Framework, which is a comprehensive tool designed to help cities monitor their progress towards sustainable urban development. And I would like you to to sort of go, go online and take a look at it. Um, it's an approach to track the SDGs and the more urban agenda. Mm -hmm. The third point is around creating structures for interdisciplinary and multi-sectoral mm -hmm. collaboration. Eff effective urban and territorial planning is instrumental in ensuring the integration of the water and sanitation sector with other urban sectors and initiatives, such as land use planning, housing, Slum, slum upgrading, transformation, health, industry, energy, and transport. Um, in, in 2017, here in Kenya, and I see Kenyan colleagues uh, are, are also on the call, we worked actively with the, with the county government of Nairobi and the State Department of Housing and Urban Development to support Mukuru slums when it was declared a special planning area, which resulted in the development of seven integrated sector plans. Um, developed by a coalition of a number of organizations in consultation with some residents. Then we have to also look upwards and we have to ensure that water and sanitation is prioritized in national and subnational urban policy, in legislation, uh, in, in national plans. And this is extremely important because this may require updating zoning laws, building codes, 
water use and regulations, things that are not always delegated to the city level. Of the um, local climate action can be promoted by integrating uh, water and sanitation in nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans. Um, in Kenya and in Nepal, uh, we, we uh, undertook policy assessments as part of our citywide inclusive sanitation project, which is just mentioned, to assess the priority and focus according to uh, sanitation in national and subnational urban development policy strategies, plans, and, and legislations. And then we validated these, these through, through national workshops and, and, uh, and developed action plans um, together with the ministries that were responsible. So it's really about the multi-level governance uh, approach. But at the same time, you also need a horizontal approach, a multi-stakeholder collaboration and, and partnerships. Uh, providing water and sanitation in many parts of the world is not just in the hands of uh, local governments or service providers or the public sector. It really requires a very large variety of stakeholders, public and private, to work together. Um, and they need to engage and, you know, decide who needs to do what and pool in sometimes their legislative, technical, and financial. My final couple of points, uh, maybe one point and then one conclusion. I think we do still need to work uh, a lot to demystify and improve public understanding of the urban planning process and, and, public, mm -hmm. and therefore public participation in that process. We know we need to evolve in planning processes, but um, it's not um, always a given on how communities can participate effectively. Stakeholders is a catch-all term, but not every stakeholder's capacity is the same, not all stakeholders are equal. Uh, how do we make sure that people have access to the planning process and they understand how to? Um, for us, participatory planning processes are key and central to our, our city plans work uh, that we implement in many parts. So finally, in conclusion, I think we cannot underestimate the transformative impact of political will and commitment by top leadership to unblock political and bureaucratic hurdles that are still impeding uh, the achievement of safe, inclusive, resilient, consistent this political will, where it exists, can drive the vision and execution of policies that shape the physical, social, and economic environmental aspects of the city. This is absolutely fundamental if we are to achieve inclusive sanitation and effective and inclusive planning. Thank you. I will leave it. Thank you so much, Shipra. For, for your intervention and for framing this so nicely. Uh, time is not on our side, so immediately I will move over to the next presentation, which is on the way forward, bringing sanitation and wastewater management to the heart of urban development, which will be presented by Sam Drabble, who is the Director of Research and Evaluation at the Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor. Sam Drabble is an urban WASH professional with over 10 years experience in urban WASH research, program evaluation, and peer-to-peer -peer learning. He currently holds organization-wide responsibility for the evaluation, research, and learning function um, at Water and Sanitation for the Urban Poor. While at WSUP, Sam has supported the rollout of research programs across WSUP seven program countries, authored or edited over 60 technical publications and led research studies for the World Bank, SRWAS, and WHO, amongst others. Prior to joining WSUP, Sam worked as an analyst in the evaluation and performance management team at RAND Europe. This built on experience with the learning and development team of the UK Institute of Government. Sam, the floor is all yours. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Anjay, for, for that introduction. And, and thank you, um, IWA and, and UN Habitat, for the opportunity to, to give this presentation on bringing sanitation and wastewater management to the heart of urban development. 
So I want to start by saying, as was as was outlined, um, the uh, recommendations that I'll be presenting in this area and the analysis. Uh, this is drawing centrally from the global report on sanitation and wastewater management in cities and human settlements. And we're going to focus in shortly on this specific question that we're addressing today around integrating sanitation with urban planning and urban development. But I, I want to provide due context to that by you know, grounding this in an overview of the, the key findings from this report uh, overall and, and the, the data collection process that was followed. So this initiative falls under UN Habitat's mandate to work towards resilient and sustainable cities and the global report, which I encourage you, um, all of you online to, to engage with if you haven't already. It aims to provide a global reference on wastewater and fecal sludge management in urban settings. And it has three complementary aims on that to raise political visibility of this issue of um, this vast issue of inadequate sanitation in cities and human settlements highlight best fit practice and provide technical guidance to the target audiences for this report which are regional national and city level decision makers there are some clear key messages that um, are, are put forward in the report so first of all uh, as many of you will know um, governments and other actors lack critical data on sanitation overall, but specifically there's a data gap that this report is contributing to address around wastewater and fecal sludge treatment, both globally and at the country level. Urbanisation is further intensifying the challenge that mandated city authorities face, including in wastewater and fecal sludge treatment. Uh, a clear message from the report is sanitation is a public good. Sanitation services must be organised into public service systems. And the report co-ops the citywide inclusive sanitation framework that has been put forward by SOAS, by the Gates Foundation and others, which breaks down citywide inclusive sanitation into three core functions, resource planning and management or finances, clear responsibilities, accountability, all of which needs to be underpinned by data management. So that's the core structure that we um, adopt in the report. We look at each of those areas. The report highlights the cost of inaction, and in doing so, it provides the rationale for a strong and urgent public response to the urban sanitation challenge. So in terms of the data collection that underpins the report, uh, data was collected in 18 focused cities across Africa, Asia, Europe uh, and Latin America. And you, you see uh, the cities represented here. And um, you know, I want to give a, a huge shout out to the many organisations that were involved in uh, the consortium for this work. So. Um, partners mm. in Vietnam, Tweedore University, in Burkina Faso, uh, 2IE, um, SOAS, Eastern and Southern Africa, Water and Sanitation Regulators Association, Agri Consult, University of College London. So we're able to leverage that consortium to collect data across these 18 cities, including um, primary data around current levels of faecal sludge and wastewater treatment. That was complemented, as was outlined um, at the beginning of this session, by five in-depth case studies, again looking at those core CYS functions in turn. So that included resource planning and management, a really strong example of uh, long-term sanitation planning and financing in Medellin. Uh, questions around responsibilities and equity and clarity of service provision mandates as those apply in Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. Looking at accountability, institutional and regulatory reform within the mega context of uh, mega city context of Dhaka in Bangladesh. Data management, um, looking at the development of the Equiserve tool in Nakuru in Kenya and how the utility Nawasco is looking to harmonize its own data management systems and climate resilience and emerging innovations. And, and you've heard already that is of course a, a central aspect of um, urban development challenges currently. And here we looked at an example from Hanoi, Vietnam of implementing climate resilient wastewater management systems. So I'm just gonna briefly synthesize the overall recommendations and then we're going to focus in on the interface of urban development and sanitation. So the, the report synthesizes the data from those 18 cities and it puts forward six core recommendations. One, cities need to invest more across the sanitation service chain, but importantly, invest more smartly. More investment is needed, but more efficient investment um, is central to what needs to be done. Secondly, wastewater and fecal sludge management services must be integrated within national and uh, local urban policies. This is building on Shipra's remarks, uh, as well as strategies and plans, including slum upgrading processes, and we'll come back to that. Responsibilities from policy making to service delivery, these need to be clear across the sanitation service chain so that actors have clear mandates to deliver upon. In terms of regulation, you know, there's much to say here, but the uh, the key recommendation that we highlight in the report is the need for greater resourcing in this area. There's inadequate financial and human resourcing currently allocated to regulation design and enforcement, um, which is necessary for service providers um, to have the incentives to invest as they should.
National monitoring systems for sanitation, wastewater and fecal sludge management must improve radically. Um, and there's the, the emphasis there is really on the national and the local level uh, support is needed for countries in developing credible public data systems which incorporate all sanitation outcomes. And finally, looking at this question of the circular economy, um, which again is, is a, an emerging area and cities need to adopt measures for safe. And really the emphasis here is on safe wastewater and fecal sludge valorization. That can play a huge role, um, but it, it, we need to have the, the regulations and the guidelines in place and, and those need to be enforced. Now I'm gonna focus in on recommendation two um, for the remainder of this presentation. So what does this report have to say on really today's central topic, which is integrating sanitation with urban development? So beginning with some, some context here, and again, building on, on Shipra's excellent keynote. So in urban environments, water access, sewage and on-site sanitation, drainage, solid waste management, street design, land tenure, these are all inextricably linked. You know, if, if you're joining this webinar as a sanitation sector professional, you know, it needs to be emphasised that to deliver sanitation outcomes, particularly in densely populated, low-income urban settlements, all of these basic services need to be addressed um, in some way. There are clear connections between, for example, on-site sanitation and solid waste management and drainage. Uh, and these connections are set out in the literature, um, highlighting here a uh, paper uh, led by Abhishek Narayan, who you'll hear from later in the panel, uh, a really useful schematic that presents the interconnections between sanitation, solid waste and water. And that means that fundamentally, if these basic services are not coordinated, the risk of service failure across any of these dimensions is magnified. Worth underlining that the integrated approach that we're speaking about today, it's fully in line with international strategic commitments. It reflects, for example, um, the new urban agenda. And there are case studies emerging in this area. I, I don't want to overstate that because, in fact, I think there's a need for more case studies in this area. But there are emerging case studies uh, where sanitation has been successfully integrated with wider urban development initiatives. And I want to go into two examples uh, from, from Africa, from Eastern and Southern Africa. So first of all, Makuri in Nairobi, and this was um, referenced by Shipra, and it is a really clear example. So just to elaborate on what's taken place in Makuru. So Makuru is one of the, the largest informal settlements in Nairobi. It was declared a special planning area in 2017. Uh, Nairobi Metropolitan Services then developed an integrated improvement plan. Uh, seven sector plans were developed by a coalition of 46 organizations organizations and those were consolidated into the Maku Integrated Strategic Urban Development Plan. That plan was formally gazetted, it had national and county government backing uh, and, and that paved the way for implementation. Participatory planning was fundamental to this, that was led by the Kenyan branch of Slum Dwellers International, it involved consultation with over 100,000 households. And this work has led to improvements in roads, drainage, street lighting, improved water access. From the sanitation perspective, what I'd emphasise is that uh, climate smart, context specific sanitation solution has been integrated within this framework. That is uh, simplified sewers. So those have been piloted in Makuru with really uh, large scale community sensitisation um, efforts to ensure operations and maintenance arrangements are in place. And, and simplified sewers represents a cost effective way of leveraging the settlement's existing trunk sewer infrastructure and so far evaluations of that model have found it to be effective. The second example I want to briefly reference is the Habitat project and this is in Chamankulo in Maputo in Mozambique. So the Habitat project is essentially the municipality, the Maputo municipality's urban development plan for Chamankulo, which is one of the most densely populated low income communities in Maputo. So this work commenced in, in 2015. It was initially a collaboration between municipalities of Barcelona and Maputo. Architectura Sin Fronteras have been absolutely central to this work, as well as the Mozambique Lawyers Association. The initial focus was on um, tenure formalization or regularization, which in the Maputo context involves changes to plot boundaries. It requires um, road access and group applications were made under what's called the DUAT process, which is the process for tenure formalization in Mozambique. And sanitation facilities have then been integrated um, within this framework. Uh, and those sanitation facilities actually have been part of the negotiating process and, and have helped to facilitate um, overall community involvement with this initiative. In terms of the outcomes, so this project is, is ongoing. It has reduced the cost to residents of formal application for 
Tenure recognition is demonstrated that slum upgrading processes of this type can improve the location selection for sanitation facilities and improve access and safety. So WhatsApp conducted actually a, an internal evaluation that included this project um, last year. And we heard directly from the municipality in Maputo that, that in their view, you know, this work and, and you see a, a picture on the, the graphic here, it's involved widening of the the, the pathways um, and, and the roads within the settlement. They think it has contributed to um, improved flood control and and even um, reduction in, in waterborne disease. And we still need to verify that. Um, but that's what we're hearing directly from the municipality. And, and partly building on those results, this work is now set to be scaled up or this model across 18 low income communities uh, in Maputo. OK, so I'm synthesising those case studies that are featured in the global report and the wider analysis. I want to boil this down into five key recommendations in this area. What does integration of sanitation with urban development practically involve? The first point, you heard it referenced by Shipra, and um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's a point that we would all have front of mind in this challenge, which is the need to advocate for high level government commitment. There are a number of barriers that have been observed around integration that includes lack of ownership of city, city sanitation plans among city governments, a lack of uniform planning frameworks, unreliable financial support, overlapping jurisdictions. But there are examples where government leadership, national and local, has helped to overcome those barriers. Nairobi, Maputo, also the government of India's slum improvement project in the 1980s and 1990s, which did produce uh, impressive results, um, in including around um, livelihoods, uh, gender, quality of life. The second area, again, building on Shipper's remarks, but I would focus in on this because I think this is foundational. This is the need to create structures for interdisciplinary and multi-sectoral collaboration, supported by the integration of slum upgrading into citywide strategic planning. And I'd suggest that we can break this down into integration at two levels. So again, for those of you on the call who are sanitation sector professionals or would self-describe as such, you know, it's a foundational step. There's more work to be done around promoting integration of water supply, sewers, and on-site sanitation. That's a first level recommendation uh, within policy institutional regulatory frameworks. That's recommended in, for example, the Africa Sanitation Policy Guidelines, guidance that has been produced by SOAS. But then there is a need for wider integration of sanitation with urban development, and that can be enabled through the creation of cross-sectoral committees. And it may in some cases also involve integrated responsibilities at ministry level, but uh, a first step is cross-sectoral committees to support those processes of po policy formulation at national level, that's one, and then slum and urban upgrading at city level, that's two. Thirdly, placing urban development departments at the centre of urban sanitation service planning. This is needed to support the proposal targeting and expansion of sanitation services at city level. And you know, we've referenced the need for clear mandates around sanitation, but that also applies to urban development, local government, housing, other sectors. To reiterate this point around community participation, you know, we've seen it in Maku, we've seen it in uh, Maputo and, and other examples, but for, for any aspect of, of urban development, this large scale community engagement is essential for delivering uh, urban development outcomes, sustainable outcomes. And finally, we'd highlight the need to create financial incentives for this integration so that can be achieved through the creation of integrated funding streams. Most external funding remains siloed within the sanitation sector. It's also tied to a short project mode of delivery. So many projects will prioritise more uh, targeted improvements in sanitation for a larger number of people, as opposed to, say, holistic uh, gains um, around multiple aspects of basic services, but potentially for a smaller number of people. And there's, of course, an intrinsic, there, there are inherent trade-offs there that need to be navigated. And funding streams need to evolve to address integrated slum improvement. Generally, funding is targeted towards, say, sanitation or healthcare. Uh, there are a few examples of packages that support integrated slum improvement. Of course, that is a large level of investment. It needs development banks, World Bank and so forth to play a key role, as the World Bank did in Makuru. Um, but we need more of those investments to support, actually, this integration. And just to close, I'm sure I'm coming up to time um, by by recapping on those key messages. I was um, challenged, I, I think, one of the preparatory sessions for this webinar to come up with a, a, a clear and provocative key message. Um, I'm presenting these five messages in the round, but I would focus in again on point two here, structures for interdisciplinary and multi-sectoral 
collaboration and uh, yeah, I really think there's a need for integration at multiple levels. So again, within the sanitation sector, there's a need for integration of water supply, on-site sanitation, sewage sanitation, you know, let's not forget that. Um, but then secondly, there is a need for more ambitious and, and arguably more complex integration of sanitation with, with urban development and we need to move forward those two aspects in parallel. Okay, I'll close there and, and hand back over. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sam, for the uh, presentation and uh, the five key takeaways which you've put forward. The next agenda and the item is now that our colleague Dewi will take us through a poll, uh, which will make the session a little bit more interactive. Dewi, over to you, please. Thank you, Andre, for the time and opportunity. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think also good morning and evening. Uh, I went through a little bit on the chat uh, to see uh, who will attend uh, to this webinar. I see the variety of uh, of the uh, participants here from all over the globe and also uh, from the different background. Uh, so this uh, will be a very interesting uh, for the next um, <clears throat> next. Uh, <clears throat> agenda, sorry, uh, which is the question and answer also final discussions. So we can uh, go through now uh, to the poll. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So we can start from the question number one. Uh, so we have to read it uh, a bit uh, careful uh, because uh, this is a little bit uh, twisted. So number one is uh, which one of the following lists describe the link between sanitation and urban planning? So uh, uh, you can uh, uh, you can uh, answer. Uh, there are five uh, multiple choices. Uh, uh, A is promoting public health and environmental protection. Uh, B is reaching all with sanitation services. C is aligning sanitation plans with other sector plans. D is planning for other public services such as water supply, drainage, and solid waste management. And the last uh, E is attracting businesses and tourism. So the question number two, which of these lists describe effective urban sanitation planning frameworks and tools? So it's a one choice uh, out of multiple choices. A, cover a wide range of technical options. B, adapt to future scenarios, uncertainties and innovations. C is to promote multi-sectoral coordinations, and D is contextualized local interventions. And uh, we can move to the third question, so which is, uh, which of the following doesn't describe the role of city planners in ensuring effective urban sanitation systems? So this is also single options. Uh, A, developing inclusive, equitable, and financially viable sanitation plans, B, integrating with other municipal services like water supply, drainage, and solid waste management. Uh, next, C, is taking over the mandate of sanitation service provisions, B, engaging stakeholders to ensure sanitation solutions are context-specific, and the last E is identifying a mix of technical solutions, including both centralized and decentralized systems. So thank you very much, Dewi. Um, I will uh, take it over from here and um, moderate the Q and A um, discussion. Uh, just remind the uh, the participants that the the Q and A tab is down there, so you can use that to post um, any of the questions that you may have uh, to the panelists, and um, we will get them. Um, answered during uh, the discussion. So we have a distinguished panel here composed of Sam, uh, who has been introduced in the previous segment. We also have uh, Kenneth Omondi Nyaseda, who is from the State Department for Housing and Urban Development. Please um, put on your, your cameras now, uh, the panelists. Then we have Naomi from UN Habitat, the planning, finance, and economic section of, of UN Habitat. And lastly, Abhishek uh, Narayan from EWAG. Uh, so I will be introducing uh, the speakers as they, they answer the questions, uh, starting with Sam. So Sam, um, uh, from your excellent presentation, 
the global report includes uh, wide ranging recommendations for the sanitation sector for both policy makers, regulators and service authorities in advancing a public service approach to urban sanitation. A key part of this challenge is integrating sanitation with wider urban development. From the research conducted for this global report, what key advice would you give for sanitation professionals in engaging with urban development processes? Great, yeah, thank you, Pierre. And thank you um, to all of those online. We've got some really good questions coming in. So I think just building on my presentation, there's, there's two further points I'd, I'd highlight. I think one is from the perspective of yeah, sanitation sector professionals, um, you know, and I think, we, we would naturally do this, but it but it needs reiteration, um, particularly when we're talking about low income, um, densely populated informal settlements. Um, you know, when advocating for sanitation improvements to those settlements, really we need to be recognising the wider needs of slum dwellers. And you know, I want to reference some some interesting research in this area um, that was I've conducted, looking at slum dweller um, prioritisation of basic services. And you know, that shows uh, that research showed that sanitation does score very highly. It is a priority basic service improvement for residents of low income, densely populated urban areas. Um, but there are other basic services, particularly solid waste management, flood control that are also central. And I think that provides kind of further weight for this argument around integration. And um, as I mentioned in the presentation, I just reiterate that integration needs to happen at multiple levels and for the sanitation sector to be able to credibly advocate integration of sanitation with wider urban development. We also need to be looking more closely than we currently are at integration of those um, more sanitation focused components like um, as on site sanitation, sewer sanitation, uh, drainage and water supply in particular. And then the the other um, point I'd, I'd offer is we to to lead by example in sanitation focused interventions by integrating wider government departments. So where sanitation planning processes are um, ongoing or being launched, you know, looking to involve all of those wider government departments in that work. And again, I can give um, examples which are also referenced in the global report of citywide inclusive sanitation planning. So in the Kenyan cities of Malindi and, and Kisumu, um, there's been um, really effective work that's taken place at the county government level involving um, the mandated utilities with responsibility for sanitation, but also wider departments like public health, uh, like transport and so forth. Every department really that has a stake in that work has been involved in that consultation process. Uh, so I, that's one aspect that the sanitation sector can, you know, can lead by example in right now um, by involving those wider departments. Um, and then of course, there's, there's further work to be done in ensuring that sanitation is in turn integrated by those departments in wider um, urban planning processes. Thank you very much, uh, Sam, for that uh, excellent response. So the next panelist is uh, Kenneth Omondi Nyaseda. So Nyaseda is uh, an urban planner with over 15 years experience. He is an assistant director uh, in the urban planning department of urban development and the coordinator of the Kenya Informal Settlements Redevelopment Program uh, under um, the State Department for Housing and Urban Development. He has previously worked as a program manager for the Italian funded Kurogocho Slum Upgrading Program. He has also worked as a program planner for the EU funded participatory slum upgrading program in Kenya in collaboration with the UN Habitat. So Ken, how does the existing urban planning legal and institutional framework uh, support access to water and wastewater infrastructure and its management. Uh, what are some of the challenges experienced in realizing the wastewater management objectives of urban plans and the implementing institution? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I wish to appreciate for participating in this. And uh, this is uh, an opportunity for me to also share experiences that I've had in the last few years uh, as an urban planner. And uh, actually, I would like to say that uh, we have a number of, uh, as a country especially, and as a department that has really contributed a lot in terms of urban planning, instituting urban planning in the country. 
uh, I can say that there has been efforts, a lot of efforts in recent years to ensure that urban planning uh, takes into consideration all sectors, including water and sanitation in terms of infrastructure. And uh, I would give a clear example in uh, planning of informal settlements, which has been most of my work. So the whole thing is about standardizing uh, planning throughout, including in informal settlement upgrading, because uh, previously informal settlement upgrading efforts uh, seemed to focus on, uh, on short-term interventions and not looking at uh, sanitation holistically. But uh, in recent years, uh, for example, in our Korogocho Salam upgrading program, the first attempt we made was to ensure that the slum dwellers, the informal settlement dwellers, who are the greatest, uh, those who they, they, they are in need of sanitation and uh, related services, ensure that planning is standardized so that it's more of taking care of informality once and for all. For example, providing standard roads uh, with clear reserves that give room for provision of services like sewerage, water and sewerage, and also uh, issues of stormwater drainage, which is also a major water and sanitation issue. So basically, we have the national urban policy that gives clear focus on how to handle sanitation under infrastructure, how to handle sanitation in terms of financing, because we have urban plans, uh, and I know most of our my colleagues in Kenya in planning will tell you that we have a lot of plans that are lying idle because there's no financing. The financing aspect misses so much when it comes to planning. And we need maybe to think of innovative ways of providing, especially sanitation. Because once you open the road reserves and those corridors, sanitation falls in place. But where do the funding come from? So that's why under in this forum, I would have wished that we push for innovative ways of providing water and sanitation. One of the panelists talks of this as a public good. And actually, this is a public good that we should really take into consideration because health of the communities relies so much on providing water and sanitation. The policies have provided so adequate, adequately for water and sanitation, but we need to move a step further. Uh, the urban development policy talks of financing. We have what we call land value capture, which I think is still a strange word in most of the urban planners' uh, mouths in, in Kenya. And I think it's time we pushed for looking at alternative ways other than the usual taxes and things for financing uh, water and sanitation. We go further and look at how can land, the land that these slums are, are, are falling on, how can we generate revenue from them through innovative ways like uh, what we call uh, what we call uh, betterment charges because i've worked with communities that are willing to contribute to to, to providing for infrastructure korogocho community actually at this moment are willing to go into their pockets as beneficiaries of the slum upgrading process to contribute to financing uh, infrastructure that includes water and sanitation They've been talking of sewerage, and I think we could go further into exploiting these efforts by communities to finance uh, water and sanitation. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Kenneth, for highlighting this um, land value capture, a very important concept uh, in, in linking uh, planning to, to basic services such as uh, water and, and sanitation. So my next question goes to Naomi Hugovost. Naomi is my colleague here at uh, UN Habitat. She is a program management officer at the planning, finance, and economy section. Uh, she, the, the section encompasses both normative and operational work on urban and ter territorial planning at all scales, including urban design, uh, public space, urban finance, and local economic development. With over 17 years of experience spanning the private sector, NGOs, and the UN habitat, uh, she, where she has spearheaded the Global Future Cities program and, and under the UN Habitat Urban Lab, 
um, that spanned 19 cities across 10 countries, fostering the development of 40 projects centered on urban uh, resilience, planning, and mobility. She has successfully managed programs and provided technical expertise in architecture and sustainable urban development, addressing social, economic, and climate and, and environmental impacts. So Naomi, uh, my question is, uh, what are some of the practical examples of urban planning projects that uh, successfully integrated water and sanitation systems? What were the main challenges encountered and what lessons were learned from these experiences? Great, right. thank you, uh, Pire, for the introduction and for all the great interventions already made. Um, yeah, I think it would be nice to take us to some of the practical examples. Um, and of course, we work globally. We work in cities that are facing different uh, water-related um, issues from coastal cities, uh, cities that are uh, embedded in, in mountains, dry lands, uh, cities that are uh, dealing with uh, rivers coming in, which is, of course, one of the original settlement strategies right around a source of water but now with climate change those um, sources are also giving uh, challenges um, but also opportunities so i would like to focus on uh, two practical examples one uh, from uh, a city in the coastal region of kenya so again africa uh, but one also in a mountainous area korok in tajikistan um, to share some of the uh, successful experiences. So in Korok, I can be quite short, it's in a valley, 30,000 inhabitants, and um, the need was to develop an environmental and socioeconomic uh, resilience plan. The, the, the town was ex expanding rapidly, and actually the water supply network um, was at stake was at risk uh, because they couldn't keep up with the uh, population growth. So there was a uh, challenge of climate change and extreme weather conditions. So there was a huge mapping done together with um, a huge stakeholder group, uh, including water and sanitation uh, service providers. So also there was one map actually on uh, understanding all the issues around water from resources to piping, to treatment plants, to pumping because they are all interconnected. It was one um, a spatial mapping to understand the system of the cities and where actually was the need most and where were the vulnerabilities and risks assessed. I think there was a great example where there was a, a lot of attention to the utilities in, in, a, in a city and they came up with integrated proposals. Some also on, on clear issues around leakages and protecting piping, for example, for uh, from um, from the extreme weather condition and erosion, uh, but definitely focus on, on the places where needed most, but also in some cases, uh, public space design, which also integrated uh, water catchment and, and green spaces in, in the city. Um, and then the other uh, location is called Hola. Uh, it's part of the Go Blue program. I think it's a very inspiring program that can sort of tackle certain issues that also some mentioned in this intervention because it's trying to integrate land sea planning. Yeah, Cipra also already mentioned it. And we are uh, implementing that in six cities in the coastal region in Kenya. Um, so there's also an opportunity to, to link it up to national planning, to link it up with knowledge sharing and developing guidelines, uh, not only for these cities, but also others. And there's one city, uh, uh, Ola, uh, it has 70,000 inhabitants, but it will double in the next 10 years and it's next to the river um, uh, to the river that goes into the ocean and they face uh, serious challenges actually on shortages which would, you would not expect um, but they uh, this plan should also integrate sanitation and water systems and also managing waste because there was also in the city but also upstream other towns that were actually hindering um, uh, the, the river and its water sources in, in Hola. So there it, it already talks about the um, dependence of water sources and it's actually regional, not only local, so the need for planning on different scales and also uh, regarding the capacity of the city 
uh, they worked with a centralized approach. So we also came up with ideas on how to decentralize it with one hub and also decentralized hubs to across the river where most of the settlements are to make sure that they could provide those uh, services. Um, and then one of the recommendations also that came out is to develop a regional water master plan, um, not only for the city, but that could benefit the city and others because it's it's all interlinked. So this going from challenges, city had challenges in service delivery, a very sectoral land use plan. Now they come up with integrated solutions and also some nature-based solutions where the community would start straight away adopting uh, some of the uh, practices on the ground. So it helps them to, in places where they're underserved, to, to already uh, make sure that they have water resources for uh, food security, for example, and also for, for drinking water. No, Maybe thank let, you. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. You, you have another example? No, I think that this was it. Uh, yeah, lessons yeah. learned. I think yeah, I sure. already mentioned a few. Yeah. Yeah, because we, we have very, very beautiful questions also in the Q&A chat. So we have uh, 10 questions already. I, I would urge the panelists to also uh, get in there and uh, you can either respond to them live. Uh, I will give you an opportunity to do that or you can just write your answer there and and uh, the, the participants would be able to access it. So, so let me go to Abhishek. So Abhishek is a researcher at EWAG, the, the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. His interdisciplinary research focuses on planning of water and sanitation globally in light of climate change and urbanization. He has made significant contributions to the concept, conceptualization and planning of citywide inclusive sanitation seawise. Abhishek's work has also been uh, in collaboration with several international organizations, including the UN World Bank, ADB, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and GIZ. Abhishek has a background in environmental engineering, policy and management at ATH uh, Zurich, Anna and Oxford Universities. He is a visiting and guest lecturer at Oxford, EPF, Lucian, um, I, I H E Delft and TU Munich. He is a recipient of the Green Talents Award and the Commonwealth Scholarship and is a World Economic Forum Global Shipper. He was also the co-founder of the Swiss Water Partnership Youth and co-led the Global Youth Movement on Water. So Abhishek, uh, the question is, what is the current state of the art in water and sanitation research as it relates to urban planning? Uh, could you discuss both well-established information and recent innovations that have the potential to scale? Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Fure. Uh, I, I think we've already heard uh, quite a lot of useful uh, information about what is the state of the art in, in practice from Naomi, uh, Sam, Kenneth, and others. But when it when it comes to research, I think we have the uh, the uh, possibility to take a step back and and observe things in a, in a slightly different lens. And in that way, there are three new themes that I just wanted to summarize. Uh, I'm happy to take specific questions on the chat and and give you more examples. But I thought this is a good opportunity to kind of highlight those three themes. So the first theme that we see a lot of uh, new things that are uh, coming up is the new scales of technology, not particularly on treatment itself, but just the different scales of sanitation and wastewater treatment technology. And we really see a paradigm shift. You already heard from the previous presenters about uh, the, the term decentralization. We're really seeing a paradigm shift towards decentralization at different scales. We all know what centralized treatment plants look like or centralized fecal treatment plants look like. But now we are also starting to see district or neighborhood scale uh, treatment uh, and, and building level systems and even now household level systems. And a lot of this is also being driven by three primary reasons. One is pollution. Uh, the other is water scarcity and having treatment plants uh, and, and sanitation systems uh, at, at a smaller scale allows reuse. And the third one is, of course, sustainability. And these challenges uh, are, are not just faced by cities uh, in low and middle income countries, right? These are all these paradigm shift 
uh, um, examples are seen across places like San Francisco and New York, but also clo uh, places uh, uh, like Addis Ababa and Bangalore. So it's just to say that we are seeing new scales of technology. That's one. Number two is we are starting to find better evidence uh, um, that brings new interlinkages between sanitation and other urban development sectors. Uh, we already heard uh, uh, Sam talk about how water, sanitation, and solid waste are, are closely related. Uh, also from Naomi about stormwater systems uh, that Kenneth already mentioned as well. And what this offers us is to start to rethink sanitation, not only as a public health and an environmental protection sort of uh, uh, factors to optimize for, but also tap into new evidence that's coming into uh, light, which is climate resilience, both in terms of greenhouse gas mitigation opportunities, but also in terms of adaptive uh, potential. And, find, uh, and, and also uh, the economics of sanitation, how it disproportionately impacts certain types of population in terms of the economic burden, depending on the type of technology that they are using or the service models. And finally, the third uh, main theme that uh, is getting a lot of traction and a lot of new uh, evidence is uh, innovative service models. And at large, these service models are being pushed by two main factors. One is resource recovery. We're starting to see that uh, um, whether it's water that we can recover from, from uh, wastewater streams or whether it's uh, nutrients that we can recover from fecal sludge uh, um, that, that is being produced. We're seeing that they provide additional revenue streams and that has created new service models. I have to put a big disclaimer here saying that there is no independently profitable sanitation service that we are aware of that is made in, uh, that is made possible through resource recovery. So it's only an additional revenue stream. And then finally, there is also these innovative uh, financing models, whether it's catalytic financing, PPPs, performance contracts. We are starting to see a lot more of of, of these happening. And I will just close saying that I've, I've just listed three different uh, um, new themes that are being linked. From a planning perspective, from an urban planning perspective, we already have approaches like the citywide inclusive sanitation, which already give us the possibility to incorporate these new uh, innovations and this, these new uh, paradigm shifts in place. And, and uh, I think that really gives us a summary of the state of the art, in my opinion. Oh, thank you very much, Abhishek. So uh, currently we have 11 questions uh, already posted. Uh, on the Q&A um, tab, uh, we have answered four of them and seven are still open. So let me give uh, the first opportunity to Sam to respond to the one on uh, the case study projects and how to sustain and manage, manage them. Just uh, a few minutes, Sam, like mm -hmm. two minutes so that we, we go through all the questions. So just short answers. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And yeah, it's, it's a great question. So I'll just pick out um, aspects that you know, we consider to be central to the ongoing sustainability of those um, interventions. So in, in Maputo, I'd, I'd highlight uh, the devolved, devolved local governance structures and the, um, the involvement of those different levels of, of local government in the intervention from the outset, and, and that continues now. So Maputo has quite a devolved structure. It has ward and block level community leaders uh, who were involved in the, um, the planning process and specifically in the siting of sanitation facilities as well. It has CBOs who are very active on the ground and there's sustained community engagement from actors like ASF and, and WhatsApp and, and all of that has contributed to ongoing sustainability. Um, there's a, a related um, research trial looking at the health impact of shared sanitation facilities, I won't go into detail, but called MAPSAN, um, which has found really um, striking impacts of improved sanitation facilities in this same uh, settlement of Chamankulo. Um, those facilities have contributed to um, a reduced incidence of stunting. Those results will be published shortly. But I mention that because I think the same mechanism is partly at play in Chamankulo. There are, um, there's widespread involvement of local governance structures, which is supporting operations and maintenance, both of sanitation improvements, but also of wider um, slum upgrades. And in Nairobi, in terms of sustainability, um, so there are a number of aspects around simplified sewers. I think this allows me just to briefly reflect on some of those questions around the simplified sewer model. So we conducted an evaluation 
validation of this model, which found positive um, results in terms of sustainability to date. And key to that has been onboarding the community early in the project. So public awareness campaigns, um, ensuring functional solid waste management and stormwater drainage. We had positive feedback from landlords interviewed for the evaluation that they were clear on their responsibilities around toilet and sewer maintenance, that those were well explained to them prior to connection and a high level of overall awareness around maintaining these systems. But the other point is that there's a connection between these systems and water availability. So simplified sewers, um, they, they, they use uh, less water than conventional sewer connections, but they do require water availability on a continuous basis to avoid blockages. So that was fought through and there was work done with the utility Nairobi Water to improve water supply in these areas of intervention through prepaid dispensers. Uh, I'll, I'll pause there. I can say something to Grace's question if you if you want me to, Pure, or or you some can... some. Uh, yeah, I think that 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 should be okay because we we have only two minutes left before we give it over to Andre. But I want to I want to eat into Andre's uh, time a little, maybe just two minutes. Uh, so um, Abhishek, there is a question from Enrico Trevisi uh, around the cross sector analysis. Can you can you respond to that in a few minutes? Just one or two minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Very shortly, I think I think as we start talking about why sanitation is important to other development sectors, especially if you know we've heard time and again that the political will is important. Who was uh, 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 kind of coordinating services at large needs to make decisions with limited resources. So it's very important for us, uh, uh, both both as economists, but also as researchers, to really establish what what is the quantifiable amount of spillover effects that is happening. I think we've you overused this investing one dollar in sanitation gives us six dollars back uh, analogy a lot, but we need to get a lot better evidence to start claiming that. And I I I would also like you know take this opportunity to say that you and habitat itself you know you have uh, excellent resources and and the mandate to look at all services uh, uh, in total with water and sanitation being one of them and it would be amazing if un habitat leads the sort of sort of the knowledge uh, uh, product or a, or or, a, or thinking around how this this integration could actually happen and one of those key questions is how can we support decision makers in in making those strategic decisions based on good quality evidence that shows that sanitation does have spillover effects. Um, uh, to, to Enrico, one simple example is, of course, how in Nigeria, uh, governments were starting to invest in uh, health sanitation and healthcare facilities, or in India, sanitation is, is actually hosted under the uh, urban development ministry for the, for the cities. Or in Uganda, how Ministry of Water is working uh, is also working on solid waste management. So I think the examples are all around, uh, uh, and and we need these integrated frameworks to help decision makers actually put money in the right place. No, thank you very much, um, Abhishek. So just to remind the participants that the the webinar slides, the video recording. Uh, the Q&A report and other recommended resources will be available in the coming week on the IWA website. Uh, please note that any outstanding questions will also be addressed in the Q&A report, uh, which will be available on, on the website. So, so let me um, wind it up here. I, I wanted to ask one more question that is very interesting for Kenneth how governments and communities can take ownership of urban planning and sanitation initiatives, particularly if they are implemented by NGOs. Uh, Kenneth, do you want to take one minute on this? Yes, thank you. I would like to take one minute, uh, the shortest time. And also this is based on experience. Yes, uh, 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 I could directly say that it depends on how communities and government like in line government agencies that work with water and sanitation are engaged from the very start of the project i can see most of the q and a are really talking about community engagement and i think part of the community are government agencies that are, that work in uh, these lines of water and sanitation so i've seen cases where uh, where the government is engaged from the start and it is clear their roles once this infrastructure is provided, there's a requirement for 
taking over this for purposes of uh, of uh, operation and maintenance. So I think when from the very start of the projects by private sector or uh, NGOs, the government is engaged and clear roles are laid down so that what is the life after the NGO has exited or the provider of this service has existed? How, what do government role now like? Uh, what roles do governments take? What roles do communities take? Because I can say clearly that communities are very key in ensuring sustainability of such projects. For example, issues of clean, uh, uh, ensuring cleanliness or uh, uh, ensuring that this infrastructure are utilized in the right way and no wrong, uh, like rubbish or, uh, for example, is channeled into water and sanitation infrastructure. This, uh, as I said, would be very important from the very start, engage the line departments and ministries and engage the communities and have the roles clearly spelled out. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kenneth. So thank you very much uh, to the panelists and also to the participants mentioned. Uh, this will also be followed up and answered as we go along. So just to remind you of the upcoming IWA webinar. So there's an, a webinar that is upcoming on strengthening water and sanitation regulatory systems, a feedback uh, on call to action draft that will happen on the 1st of November. Uh, 2024. Then there will be the Digital Water Summit in Bilbao, Spain from the 12th to the 14th November 2024. The next one. Yes, and uh, you are uh, also asked to join the IWA network of, of water professionals. They use, if you use that code, you get a 20% uh, discount of the new uh, membership. So let me hand it over to Andre to conclude the, the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. I must say this has been a very, very inspiring and very, very rich session. I think I've learned a lot from all of you, from all the questions, from the speakers, the panelists. And, you know, what we say is water is, is health and sanitation or water is life and sanitation is dignity. So if we want to really have a dignified urban planning an urban management process, we really have to make sure that urban planners put actually sanitation into the center of their work and into their uh, planning and processes. So I think this, this interlinkage is extremely important. What I would also like to do is I'd like to draw your attention to the recently concluded Summit of the Future, which adopt the Pact for the Future. And I would like to encourage all of you to go through the Pact of the Future and look at the Pact of the Future because it makes specific recommendations and requests specific actions related to water and sanitation. And I think these actions can be picked up. And one of the additional actions is actually local and regional governments and the role of local and regional governments in accelerating the sustainable development goals. And here, local and regional governments actually play a very important role in addressing sanitation and waste management if they want to accelerate uh, the sustainable development goals. So with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think a very, very inspiring, successful sessions. Thank you and congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. And I would here with like to close the session with one minute over time. So I think it's great uh, that we've managed to achieve this in one and a half hours. Thank you so much to all of you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.